when we think of the modern university in Africa. And I'm not talking here about the university, I think in general. Since there were famous ancient seats of learning in Africa before colonialism that we know about. We know about the Alexander Museum <coughs> and Library in Cairo that was founded <coughs> in the third century BC. We know, as Paul Zaleza has reminded us, that in Ethiopia, uh, education was included in the 12th century uh, in the system of monastic education, where you had systems like the Kin Bet or the School of Hymns, followed by the Zema Bet, which was the School of Poetry. Uh, and at the pinnacle of this was an institution called the Metzahef Bet, which was the School of Holy Books that provided a broader and more specialized uh, education in religious studies, in philosophy, in history, in the computation of time, and the calendar, and various uh, other subjects. And then, of course, we also know that there was the Ezetuna University in Tunis, founded in 732, and the al Karawin University uh, in Fez in 859, <coughs> incidentally founded by a young uh, immigrant female princess from Tunisia called Fatima al Khikri. Now, the university attracted students and scholars from Andalusia, from Spain, from West Africa. And then, of course, there was also, as we know, the institutions of Timbuktu and so on, which you have very great scholars who work on here at UCT. So the university as a concept, as an, as a practice, as an institution, predates colonialism. But what we are talking about here is the modern European university in the form that is globalized today. The form of the university that mostly arrives in the rest of the African continent uh, in the wake after colonialism, because they never bothered to think that universities were important to build in most of the continent. But of course, South Africa, with its particular settler colonial history, has this long encounter with the modern European <coughs> university. And being at the heart of uh, what I have described as epistemic violence, the university then is not simply, <coughs> as this very moment that you're living through attests, a conveyor belt of automatons or of robots or of uh, ideological zombies uh, who enact the wishes of the dominant order. The modern university then is also the site of constant invention, of contestation, of negotiation, subversion, and potentially, we would like to think, reinvention. Now, the concept of decolonizing the university then is about justice, and the kind of justice that I think addresses the epistemic violence of colonial knowledge and of colonial thought. In many respects, we in South Africa, we have to accept this with humility, are Mafiki Zolos. We are Johnny come lately to the problem that many before have grappled with. Whether it be in the early debates of Lovedale College that became Fort Hare, uh, whether in the post-colonial reform of education in South Asia and the Middle East, whether in the famous debates that happened on the hill in Dar es Salaam, or the Ibadan and the Dakar schools <coughs> of history in, in, uh, in, Dar es, in Tanzania uh, and Senegal, or in the previous experience of the crass Africanization of just about everything and anything that happened in Mobutu Zahir. There is much to study and much to learn from. There are many examples to be inspired by, but I think there are also many examples to learn about the pitfalls of things that we might not want to repeat. And when we at colleagues in the Center for Humanities Research a few years ago started a program trying to think about this, uh, the humanities, its colonial inheritances, the idea of a post-colonial critique and so on, I think one of the first things that we learned was that this was actually <coughs> an obligation, an invitation to learning once you become aware of this question. It was a moment, I think, of coming to terms with how many, uh, uh, with the realization that our Eurocentric education had equipped us to do many things very well, but that it had also equipped us rather excellently to be very ignorant of most of the world and arrogant that are, uh, and also arrogant about our ignorance, in the sense that the civil world could not offer us anything that we needed to learn from, right? This reinforced, I think, the heritage of settler colonialism, directly or indirectly in South Africa, because we, after all, do think that we are part of the West, right? The assumption then in this, in this arrogance of ignorance 
can be traced, I think, to the old mantra of the colonial administrator in India, mm. Thomas Babington Macaulay, who famously quipped, a single shelf <coughs> of a good European library <coughs> was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. Right. Now, uh, Macaulay didn't bother to diss uh, Africa because, of course, him along with Hegel did not think there was even any signs of civilization here to talk of, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this, I think, is what we call epistemic violence. It authorizes thinking about others in a way that enables political and economic violence to be enacted on their bodies, that reinforces the prejudice that there's nothing much to learn from other parts of the world that can make us better <coughs> people, that can make us create a better world. This, I think, is what we're talking about when we say we have a Eurocentric <coughs> worldview in our education. It centers the idea of Europe as a metaphor, because we all know Europe is in a bit of a crisis, and turns all others into bit players or loiterers without intent on the stage of world history, either too lazy to do anything ourselves or always late and running behind to catch up with the jammy shuttle of Western modernity. <laughs> <laughs> right? Eurocentrism, centrism, then, I think, is not the same thing as whiteness, <laughs> since we all know that our forms of modernity, which, we, which are so celebrated today, that reinforce the idea of who has created the best kind of society that we should all emulate, <coughs> that Eurocentric modernizers come in all shades, all shapes and sizes, bearing all kinds of passports. And here we must say, rest in peace to Lee Kuan Yew, the founder of the modern state of Singapore, uh, uh, a fantastic example of a Eurocentric modernizer. Now the question might, be, might well be, yes, we recognize that we have left out people from history, that we've left out Africa from our curriculum. We can resolve this epistemic violence through the justice of now including uh, Africa in the university mm. by naming things and building new statues by adding a new course to the degree, by adding a new book to the syllabus. I think that that's all good, that that's important struggles that we are all waging, and that we must celebrate when we achieve the victories there, because they don't come easy. But I think we also have to ask ourselves always, what more can we do <coughs> towards undoing the epistemic violence of colonial knowledge? Should we settle for a supplemental concept of history? where we now add African studies onto the existing curriculum <coughs> with the danger of once more ghettoizing ourselves from the mainstream disciplines? Mm. Do we have to reconfigure the entire curriculum in ways that allows us to think the world, now equipped with the intellectual heritages and resources that we've been taught so uh, studiously to ignore from across the previously <coughs> colonized world? Who then will, will, will have to ask, will teach our teachers if our existing faculty are limited in their interests and in their expertise? How will we recruit new knowledge into our university that will break with geographic and linguistic apartheid that, so that the antiquated but cute idea of a department of English can be a department for the comparative study of literature? How do we bridge the continental fault lines between Anglophone, Francophone, Lucophone, and Arab in Africa through translation work? And should a decolonized knowledge project ask questions about the work that the disciplinary forms of knowledge in the modern university do to reinforce unequal power relations or inhibit our thinking about certain <coughs> objects of knowledge in particular ways? What is the shape, the form, the content of a university? These, I think, are all questions that are open to us if we really grasp the moment that we're in uh, in the country. I'll just, in a few minutes, give you an example of what I'm trying to talk about if we, if we change our kind of thinking about the objects of study and the problems that we are interested in, which is to do with the interest of mine and the kind of work that a group of students and I are doing on political violence and citizenship in Africa. To be more precise, in Northern Congo, in Nigeria, in Uganda, in South Sudan and Sudan, in Rwanda, in Northern Mali and Libya. Now, most of this kind of violence is studied conventionally by political scientists. And when you read most of the political science literature on Africa, I will wager most of it comes from certain parts of the world. Most of it has certain concepts and assumptions that it works with. Most of it is premised on the idea that there's an ideal form of the modern state, and some of us live in it, 
and the rest of us live in various degrees of perversions, of departures <coughs> from it, and of failures of it. Mm. Ours are pathological versions of the modern state. The most empirical version of this kind of political science thinking is one that measures how far we deviate from the norm. What your colleagues here call the Afrobarometer, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, most, the most poetic, I would say, and theoretical version of it you might find in the writing of a French chronicle, <coughs> Jean-Francois Bayard, who somehow is curiously sometimes echoed by my good Cameroonian friend who wrote a very widely celebrated book on, called On the Post Colony. <laughs> they all tell us that we are pathological deviations of the script of modern political society in one way or another. Now, to the despair of all of us scholars, many political elites, modernizing nationalists alike, contemporary <laughs> political violence on the continent remains predominantly articulated in terms of identity. All those particular things that we were told uh, by a good colonial education that secular modernity would emancipate us from, that the promise and hope of, a, of our liberal political freedom in particular was that it would offer us the political form, the nation state, a political value, universal equality, and that it would cultivate freedom as the in, as individualized, as the rational exercise of our choice <coughs> without external impediments. Now, what for me might be interesting is to, to do, if we are thinking about new ways of thinking, is to talk about contemporary political violence outside of these assumptions of failure. <coughs> Not to swing the bat in the other way to celebrate failure now as achievement, but rather to measure or, th or theorize ourselves on the basis of what we are becoming, not on the basis of what we are not becoming. If we were to move, to move <coughs> towards emancipative, less violent, egalitarian societies on the continent, <coughs> we would have to reimagine political community grounded in the particular histories that we inherit. Colonial rule, settler colonial rule in our case, and the violences that I spoke about earlier. If we are fighting over identity questions, then we might need to better understand how colonial power solidified the distinction between the native and the non-native, between the indigenous and the foreigner, between race and tribe, in a way that has transformed cultural differences across the continent into a form of difference that matters politically, where people are going to war with each other over it. We know that the teleological assumption, the idea that we're all moving somewhere together to one uh, destination, of colonial modernity was that freedom, equality, and the market would result in the dissolution, in the breaking up of, of all these things that hold us attached, if you like. Whether the, these be religious attachments, or ethnic attachments, or racial attachments, other than the national, which was okay to be attached. Attachments were seen to be the cultural things that we inherited from a pre-colonial period, from a pre-modern period, and that we would, with modernity in progress, move towards a flourishing sphere of civic life of individual uh, celebration, right? Now, we know in some ways that that has not happened, that that has failed in many places where it has been tried. And yet, I think that the grounds of the modern political community of liberal uh, sensibilities, coupled with the market economy, has continued to offer the promise of a peaceful future best suited to the flourishing of human life. It still sees itself <laughs> as the dominant way to imagine freedom. And the corporate versions of Africa rising and the corporate version of Afropolitanism, I think, lives on in this very hope. Mm -hmm. In particular in Africa, I think the trouble in realizing this image of the good society has been defined as the cultural problem of the persistence of what we might call tribalism. We now add more prominently after northern Mali and northern Nigeria, religion. Mm. And we would add after the struggles of settler colonialism in southern Africa, race. <coughs> These are said to work against our aspiration towards an abstract equality, abstract citizenship. Now most liberals have concurred that, <coughs> that the attachment of culture would evaporate over time. But also many of us on the left sh shared this modernist assumption as well even though we were critical of the use, uh, that it was useful for global markets to have wars and disruptions on the continent. The left also saw the invention and the use of identity as something that people 
conjured out of uh, thin air in order to mask their real economic interests, in order to control the natural resources of the continent so that neo-colonial states could, could continue to exploit it for its primary commodities. And these were very important insights of political economy that were remarkable, but they do seem to be wanting. If we are to think our way then out of the post-colonial predicament, we would have to take the question of how we, th how we think of the problem very seriously, <coughs> right? And we are currently witnessing more acute expressions of political violence articulated along religious and identitarian lines, which makes then the centrality, I think, of historicizing the concept <coughs> of citizenship, of difference, of majority and minority distinctions even more important today, right? We are reminded that the promises of liberal freedom uh, remain hegemonic, but also, I think, intensely and increasingly inadequate to both think with and to construct a political community out of. Now, it may be that I think that we need to decolonize the concept of difference itself, rather than aspire to dream of the, to be the liberal individual who exercises rational choice, as most political scientists tell us. It may mean we, we need to theorize a concept of culture that depoliticizes cultural attachments if colonialism politicized them. The problem then is not cultural attachments per se, or identity per se, but politicized culture and politicized identity. When we move away from liberal modernity's assumptions, away from the despair, uh, the discourse of failure, I think we can begin to theorize our political modernity in, in the positive rather than in the negative with all its messiness. Now my point is not to get you to think about these kinds of questions that I'm interested in, but to give you an example of what it might mean to think a problem in the light of the critique of knowledge of production and to try to think it differently so that different possibilities emerge, different horizons of political imagination might open up. Less clear because we don't know where they're leading, we don't have an ideal type, we don't have a model, but in some ways more uh, useful, more productive, and more encouraging uh, for us politically. So when you ask, what does it mean to think the world from where we are at, from our location, and ask what it means for how we organize knowledge, how we teach, who we teach, who we compare ourselves to, who we learn from, all of the questions that you have been posing uh, these last few weeks. When you ask those kinds of questions, you are going to the gut of liberal colonial sensibility that lives on in the present. The one that goes all the way back to Macaulay's dismissive remark about who produces anything worth being called civilization. <coughs> the question then might be asked of you, of us, do you want to return us to the particular against the universal? Do you want us to step out of the global and the cosmopolitan and only think the local is relevant as a criteria for knowledge, not really a straitjacket for parochialism and narrow thinking? These are important and difficult questions to grapple with. But the binary between the local and the global, between the universal and the particular, I think might be a mischievous distraction. Why should we put the local against the global or the universal against the particular? Mm. Why can't we change the menu rather than be pressured to only accept the options presented to us? Mm. It may actually mean that we think more carefully about the argument of the Senegalese philosopher Suleiman Bashir Jan, who has suggested that the way to think about decolonization and the universal is not to concede the universal to an imperial imagination, but to work towards a truly universal universalism. We need not give up then on the uni in the university, but we can try, I think as you all are, to redefine the very idea of the university itself. Could you project, please? I'm sorry. I can't sorry. hear you on the side. Speak louder. Oh, sorry. Um, some of the things I started thinking about during your presentation were how we were losing the focus on Africa. It's now become this globalized, world, West Eurocentric view. But shouldn't that be? Shouldn't we reclaim that view, starting at a lower level, like primary school, secondary school, and then when you come to an environment like university, where it's more globalized? Well, it's different people from different countries, 
different languages, cultures, then that's where the meeting of minds can begin, moving forward from one view, Eurocentric, to that of a more universal global view. So you get ideas from China, <coughs> India, Brazil, America, anywhere, everywhere. Wouldn't that be how it's going to play out, and how would that even happen? So. Okay. Okay. Right. Uh, right, so I was a little bit scratchy. Thank you for your presentation. I was thinking of a couple of things. Mm -hmm. My reading interests can come out just strongly, but do you think that it's possible? We talk about the substance and form of the university, not the conceptual university. So the one we're studying right now. To decolonize it without violence at all of those three levels. First question. The second question, because I think the answer is no. That's my theory. If the answer is no, uh, is it necessary to retain the university in what you're talking about? So this has happened in several other spaces. Is it then necessary for us? Is this a conversation that preempts movement to another space you talked about? Universities being authoritative knowledge production spaces, centers of <coughs> knowledge production. So rather create new spaces that are analogs to what a university had attempted to provide. Mm -hmm. um, because the core principle of changing this university is fundamentally impossible with violence. Okay. Yeah, just three questions. One is you, you had mentioned the political depoliticizing cultural values. Um, and if those cultural values are created by a colonial system, the colonial system essentially grouped black people together and said, here's your identity, and took away the idea that there were different cultural groupings amongst black people in general. How do you now go about depoliticizing that? Do you then say that all black people should now have separate identities again? Do you maintain that they maintain one identity and we depoliticize it as one identity? How do you start fragmenting that again and whether you should fragment it? Because that will be just repeating what had happened before. The other question is, everything that you've said and I've been trying to figure out how this works, how do you apply that? Because it's very easy to apply it in, for lack of a better phrase, like humanities sort of subject areas. So how do you apply that to something such as engineering and science? Um, how do you fundamentally change the mindset of those who are studying in engineering so it doesn't become <coughs> engineering for Africa, if that makes sense, but a fundamental rethink about how the construction of buildings is based on African principles um, and not just a Western concept of what makes a building stand. Um, the last question is touched on what Brian said, and it's the idea of what form of violence do you advocate for in a university space? And in a university space, I believe that the violence that you have is the violence of argumentation and how your idea is better than another idea, how violently it takes over that structure. Not necessarily physically violently, but how you can violently dismantle an idea in a university space. And whether that is what you're advocating for, or whether what you're saying is that they should just be a balanced opinion of views. I am for the former of the idea that I think an African narrative should violently take over the Eurocentric idea of what happens in a university, but should be based on better arguments and not just laissez-faire ad hoc. Okay, okay I, I can take one more question for this round. Okay. Um, I would just like to ask uh, um, about the violence. Uh. Could you, could you do something with, with Karl Marx's uh, sentence of violence as a midwife of history? Okay. I'm going to try and, uh, and answer, uh, hopefully, uh, most of your questions uh, in a sort of more general way, and uh, some of them individually, but some of them uh, together. And of course, these are you know these are questions I'm hoping you're asking to you as a group, right? That you will think about, and I will think about, because I don't obviously have the answers uh, to many of them. But I think uh, so to think about. Um, uh, this question of violence, uh, decolonization, can it only be a violent process, as 
you know, who said that. Uh, and of course, uh, when I'm describing the three sets of violences that characterize what I uh, would say is South African settler colonialism, the political violence of uh, dispossession, denationalization, the economic violence of, of the market that, uh, that moves people around in particular ways, and the epistemic violence that enables the thinking of that. Right? Uh, I think that, of course, uh, the, the challenge of epistemic violence is in some ways that because it precedes uh, the action, it is the thought, it is often the one that appears least violent of all, and therefore least visible to us, because the other kinds of violence, particularly political violence, is very directly observable, measurable, uh, witnessable, right, in a very somatic sense. We see people, those dislocation, we see their disposition, we, we photograph it, we witness it, we write about it, we narrate it. Um, but of course, it is the kind of uh, ways in which modern thought has enabled violence that has become so normalized that we're less troubled by it. Now, I would say, if I were to combine Marx's uh, notion of, of, of the violence being the midwife of history with the, with the story that Fanon gives us, that uh, decolonization can only be a violent process, and add to that Lenin's notion that you only, uh, you know, that sometimes you have to crack an uh, egg to make an omelet, you have to do uh, bad things to do good. I think. One of the challenges that we inherit in this kind of discourse is does that notion of violence and social change work for us? Right? Do we have to, in a sense, work with the idea that we have inherited from a certain kind of modernist sensibility <coughs> that the uh, ends justifies the means? Now, even within the modernist uh, tradition, within Enlightenment thought, there were people who were very critical of that kind of argument with the idea that if you enact social change through violence, you create a society saturated with violence. And there is a debate about whether Fanon, in that sense, uh, you know, this might require a whole uh, conversation and, and focus on its own, was in his uh, essay on concerning violence, uh, prescribing violence or diagnosing violence. Mm. Right? And the diagnose the, dif the difference between the diagnostic, which is Fanon's training as a psychiatrist and his mode of thinking a problem, and the prescriptive is up for debate. Right? Now, what we are talking about here, of course, is in a sense uh, the very modest projects of what are, what are, at least for me, and you're talking about where do we start at the school, at the university, right? Is what are the spaces available to us where we have access to do certain things, and that we inhabit certain relations that enable certain things. Now, I would say that as much as we recognize that, uh, that universities are authoritative spaces that certificate knowledge, we have a critique, of course, that, of the idea that, that knowledge can only come from within the university, and we have a critique of, where perhaps we can share that critique of, of the conceit of, of, of professional academics to think that we are the only people that can produce knowledge. We know that knowledge is produced in many spheres of the society, in many uh, spaces, by many <coughs> people, right? But the authoritative knowledge does within the system come from within the university, whether it be that you're trained as an engineer or you're trained as a humanities scholar or a school teacher and so on. Now, we can be faced with a situation where we might not need to give up the one for the other. That in fact we can we can cultivate the spaces, uh, you know, where intellectual and uh, critical conversation happens outside of the university, oh, yeah. but we can also see that we inhabit a strategic space by being a kind of generation of scholars who can occupy the spaces that need to be filled in the university down the line. So we don't have to be again there in a situation, I think, where we have to choose one or the other. But we can think very strategically about what can we do in the spaces that we're in. And it seems to me that this is one of those kinds of experiences where something is being enacted, right? Not within the rules of the system necessarily, right? But precisely because it transgresses the rules of the system, it enables change with of the rules of the system, in a sense, right? right? 
So I, you know, I'm not um, advocating any kind of uh, violence, but I think I'm talking about the ways in which epistemic violence can be undone from within the kinds of spaces that we that we have access to and that we can work within. Now, the question of um, uh, that I raised about uh, you know maybe trying to think about political violence in a way that doesn't aspire to a model, an imagination, uh, an ideal type of the state where we all become liberal individual subjects, we don't have any attachments because attachments are bad, we don't want people to have religious attachments or what we call tribal attachments and these things. It's a very difficult notion because of course we know we, we inherited, we come from colonial systems that enforced difference on us, right? And that we know that our responses to that difference enforced on us was to reject the categories of the difference that was enforced on us, right? So it was not simply that the apartheid state said you are all black, or uh, denied ethnic difference. In the apartheid said, uh, apartheid state cultivated ethnic difference in the homelands, right, through the Bantustan systems, and here they were echoing and practicing a technology of rule that had been developed elsewhere on the continent, cultivating ethnicity, right? The question that I'm trying to pose, and this is a difficult one, is has our rejection <coughs> of colonial categories of difference and the aspiration towards universal citizenship, of sameness, of homogeneity, mm. right? Has that been a desire that runs us into trouble all the time because we continue to see violence enacted on them? We continue to see as much as the market grows, as much as people <coughs> develop uh, in, as workers or as peasants, that they also continuously everywhere hold on to these attachments. So maybe, one of the ways that we think about this is that we don't reject difference because colonialism imposed it on us. In the same way that we don't reject universalism because it has a certain kind of colonial and imperial history, we maybe take these things and we say, we have a different concept of difference. You could not actually create, you can, you know, the, re the, the response to the colonial legacy is to say, you could not actually create and cultivate a concept of difference that was democratic, egalitarian, <coughs> open, respectful of others. Maybe we can. Maybe we can construct the political without it being a coerced identity, without it being an enforced identity, without, with, that it has voluntarist elements, that people choose the identities they want to be. But that we, that we try to think our way out of this limited options all the time. Because things were imposed on us, we rejected it. But let's think about what we can create in its place without the legacies that they come with. You know? mm -hmm. And that means thinking of possibilities in a sense, and experiments and strategic alliances and strategic and ways of thinking. So it is really to say that I think that we're at a moment where the, the sort of hold of uh, the uh, colonial modernist imagination on the world of liberal sensibilities is really at a crisis across the world. And we confront various kinds of political violences that we're trying to make sense of. And maybe it has to do with not simply trying to aspire to something that we keep failing at, mm. but trying to think about why is it that we're failing. So it's really to return to the problem, rather than what is the solution now? What is the solution now? Maybe we haven't got the problem right. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it's about. Mm. How, in the situation that we're in, handle the colonized mind? So if we're going to then say, I acknowledge my colonized mind. Like, what what do we then do with that? Because we are we are hitting brick walls left, right, and center. You know, we've been in this room for a long time, and everywhere we turn, we hit against a new brick wall of our own kind of systematic, Eurocentricized knowledge systems. You know, even when they even when they look black or they feel black. The longer we talk about them, we realize that they're not. So then how do we, how do I handle that in myself in a way that's in any way going to convince someone who's no, who does not feel like decolonizing their mind? If for me it's difficult to realize and, 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 and actively keep pushing, how do I get people who are not as invested in that project <coughs> to engage with it? Is, it. is it a matter of having to, in, to, to actively engage with the discourse until you're bloody in the <coughs> forehead? Or like, and, and then maybe we get somewhere. Because then it's a very small group of people who are going to be able to do this. You know, and it takes, it's, it's, it's taken a hell of a lot of stamina. Um, 
to be here. Um, so then I'm, I'm asking how, how do you propose that to all the rest of us colonized minds, you know, who are not in this room? You know what, like, you know, practically it's, 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 it's very, it seems like quite a monumental task. That's my question. I wanted to ask about, you spoke about corporate, like, Afro, like, Afro, African Rising and Afro politics. Afro, like, is there a way to take out the sort, sort of corporate capital association with both of those concepts and reimagine them? Because I think as they're conceived now, um, it is a very sort of capital um, endeavor which you need sort of, sort of material means to access those two ideas. So, how do you reimagine those things and take the corporate capital elements out of them? Okay, so um, I basically want to take off from where Pulem left off. Um, my question is actually going to be a reiteration of those. Um, but now, with, 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 um, with religion this time, how then do we also take, I mean, we're looking for an ideal, an ideal university space and an ideal society. Where, where, where equality um, reigns supreme in a sense. Um, we all know that, that religious law doesn't, doesn't evolve with time. Usually um, it's, it remains stagnant. And then how do we also now bring what we feel, how, how do we also bring out what we feel is, a, is um, our societal view of things? How, how then we, do we incorporate them into religion and how do we get, how do we, how do we then in, influence religion into and to take it upon what we are also proposing to the table as a new as to move on in our life. Um, no, I mean the question of uh, cosmopolitan, the Afropolitanism and Africa rising narrative and the market, I, I, you know, I think that that will happen. It's too um, powerful, a sort of juggernaut available to marketing people and all kinds of corporate types. It's sounds very n uh, nice and it uh, has a certain <coughs> kind of aesthetic value to it and one can only struggle against creating alternative conceptions of it to work with different ways of doing that. Um, but you know, it is it is such a strong narrative. Um, so I, I can't see necessarily how they're going to give up on that in time soon, but I think there are other ways to do that, you know, and, and other ways to claim ways to do that. Um, how do we deal with the, sort of the colonized mind and the <coughs> question of religion? I, you know, I think, well, one of the things I didn't say when I was speaking, I left this out was, one of the things that colonial modernity does is it separates, um, as I said, this idea of attachments becomes part of your pre-modern identity. And the idea is that progress leads us to become individuals who are freed from the attachments whether, uh, of, of culture, if you like, right? And one of the assumptions there that it builds up is that the realm of culture is static, is fixed, is unchanging, is conservative, is tradition. And the realm of freedom and citizenship of the individual is dynamic, it changes, it's flexible, and that is where progressive freedom happens. So it pits, if you like, culture, tradition, backwardness against uh, freedom, individual, reason, and so on. And I think that when we think of uh, tradition, whether it be cultural identity or the question of religion, along those lines, in some ways we are uh, repeating a certain kind of inherited concept of religion or of culture that we work with. That we all know, in fact, that the story perhaps is not as clear as that because there are many uh, religious identities that are always being renegotiated, that they are always multiple, that they are always <coughs> contested from within, that they can be both the, the ways in which colonization was authorized but also the source of anti-colonial revolts in Latin America through liberation theology. So these stories are always ambiguous in the same way that what we are talking about here is the way in which liberal modernity narrates its own biography. It tells the story about itself in the way that says, 
this is the best way to be free. This is something that doesn't have a culture. This is universal. When in practice we know if you go to certain European states, you have to do things by certain cultural practices in order to fit in. You have to uh, meet certain civilizational tests, uh, as they used to call it in the old colonial days. Now it's all kinds of other things about how you bring up your kids, about how you conduct your life in private. So the private sphere is as under scrutiny, right? You're not this liberal free individual. Even So even where it's said to exist in the ideal form, it never actually really exists, right? So in some ways, all of these, the distinction between the secular and the, and the civic and the religious and the private, are all categories in some ways that are up for debate and up for discussion. How we convince others of this is, as I said at the beginning, <coughs> epistemic violence is in some ways is the hardest thing to persuade people about because political violence we could, we could see and we could develop a concept of justice for it. Economic violence we see around us all the time and we can identify <coughs> the problem and we can debate what the solution is, but we know that there's a problem and we know that we need to do something about it, right? But when we talk about something like modernizing nationalists, people who have all been trained to think that the solution to a society must look a particular way and that they've inherited those sensibilities, right? And are part of uh, enforcing them now in some ways or policing them or developing them or, you know, all kinds of complicated things that go on in power relations. Then it is a constant debate and a constant battle. And, I mean, I was, uh, you know, there's a few of you now, but I was at the, the when the, when Mamdani was here in, uh, and, the, and the big seminars that happened at UCT, and uh, I was a student at UWC at the time, the numbers of people <coughs> who supported him were very small, smaller than by far the number of people in this group. The number of uh, faculty or students that, that endorsed his argument in those meetings were tiny, right, to the extent that he felt incredibly isolated. So that was then. This is, now it seems to me the way this thing is growing, you know, that you might think that you're small numbers, but this is a, you and the amount of people, the reverberations of this outside of this room and across the country is incredible. So you, you can't measure it necessarily immediately, but it's also that I mean, uh, you know, small, uh, small groups have always made incredible changes uh, in the world. In, in any kind of uh, massive social upheaval, it is small groups of people that, that are involved in that. So that, in a sense, sh shouldn't discourage you because the effects of it, you can't necessarily see from within the group and you can't see uh, <coughs> at the moment. But it is, I mean, it is a tough, you know, I mean, in the, in the 80s in the student movement, we had a slogan, you know, each one, each one. But when we were boycotting classes, we didn't stay away from school. We did the same thing. We came to the school and you knew you couldn't touch the textbook, so you had to find all kinds of other sources of knowledge and you got people to come and speak and, you know, all this stuff was banned. I mean, we'd never seen a book by Fanon. We heard it was a rumor that, you know, you might have seen a photocopy of a yeah. photocopy that somebody had. So, the you know, there was... But, but it's always that this notion, I think, that has been part of the, of the movements here is each one teach one. We will learn together. And I think the more that faculty are persuaded not to be pers uh, defensive, to be say, you know, and the more we can recognize and acknowledge that, yes, I recognize that that's important knowledge, but I don't know it and I can't teach it and it's, uh, I'm not familiar with its history or its language or its uh, debates, but I'm prepared to invite or in, uh, bringing people who can, then I think we open up a space. Little by little we do that, you know. But it's, it's the first thing has just been to recognize that there are things we don't know, I think. And then to say, let's not be defensive about that, but to open ourselves up. It seems to me that that is <coughs> some kind of usefulness. In incremental way. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a side.